Shall we now turn to the Word of God? The letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. Hebrews 13, 1 to 7. I was going to take the whole chapter this morning, but when I got into it, there's just so much truth there, we're going to split it into two halves. So, first seven verses this morning, Hebrews 13, 1 to 7. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I forsake you, never will I leave you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can men do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I'm afraid I've come without all my sermon notes for this morning, but I've got the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and that should suffice. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll just take my lips and use them and take our hearts. May we all be receptive to your Word for Christ's sake. Amen. It's a very popular idea that it doesn't matter what you believe so long as you're sincere. And the story, which I may have shared with you before, which brings home to me more than anything else, that the false falsity of that statement is the story of two little babies born in a maternity hospital somewhere here in the southeast of England, and they needed an urgent operation immediately, both of them. They were rushed to the theater, and there the babies were prepared. And the nurse on duty in the theater was asked to go and fill a syringe with a certain drug to give to them, to prepare them. She went to the cupboard, she filled it from the wrong bottle. They brought the drug, they injected the two babies, and they died a few minutes later. And at the inquiry that was held later, the nurse said these words, and I quote her exactly. She said, I sincerely believed I had the right bottle. But if you're sincerely wrong, then your beliefs can do damage to yourself, to other people. For you see, the real truth is that it's not a man's behavior that makes a man, but what he believes. Belief is the inside of him, behavior is the outside. And if you change a man's outside and change his behavior, you haven't changed him. You may have done nothing to touch the real person. And therefore the Bible, with true insight into human nature, believes that if you can change a man's beliefs, that then his behavior can be put right in the proper way. And indeed this is fundamental to life. All commercial advertising is based on the fact that if you change a man's beliefs, you'll change his behavior. Take all the flood of advertisements about detergents and soap with which we're bombarded. They are trying to convince you or trying to get you to believe that this product is better than that one, knowing that once they've changed your belief, you will go to the nearest shop and you'll change your behavior. Or take the government's anti-smoking campaign. The shock films that are put out on television are designed to change your beliefs. You see, one of the most fundamental beliefs of human nature in its fallen state is this, it could never happen to me. That's a fundamental belief. And no matter how many disasters we see in other people or tragedies we read of, there's something in us that says it would never happen to us. But the anti-smoking propaganda is to change that belief until you believe it could happen to you. And once you've changed your belief, you are likely to change your habits and not buy Tupney cancers. And so the whole of life is concerned really with our beliefs and only then are we in a position to change our behavior. And this is the pattern in the Bible again and again. In epistle after epistle, there is a whole section on belief first 
and then and only then are questions of behavior tackled. And that's the only way in which you can finally redeem human nature. Change the inside, then you can change the outside. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is a particularly clear example of this. Chapters 1 to 3 are all about our belief and our salvation. Chapters 4 to 6 are all about working it out in our relationships, in our leisure, in our social life, and so on. Now, the letter to the Hebrews is exactly the same. Up to the end of chapter 12, we've been dealing with your beliefs. What you believe about Jesus is far better than angels, priests, prophets, offering a better sacrifice than animals, worshipping in a better sanctuary than an earthly building, or better. Now, have you believed that? If so, then you've joined a long line of heroes of faith, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Samson, Barak, and all the rest of them. You've joined a line of those whose belief changed and therefore whose behavior also changed. And the final definition of faith is given in chapter 12 at the beginning. Faith is stripping off everything that handicaps you and the sin which clings to you and looks to Jesus and runs the race to finish it. And all through this letter we've had the emphasis on finishing what you've started, on continuing in the faith, on completing the course. It's one thing to begin to be a Christian, it's quite another to go on after five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, and to keep on going on. Somebody in this congregation told me the other day they'd been walking with the Lord for seventy years. That's a good race to run. And this is the whole emphasis. Now in chapter 13, down to earth with a bump. And the tragedy is that some people think we've reached a kind of postscript, the kind of PS that you put at the end of a letter if you were writing to one of your children away at school or away overseas, and you would write a newsy letter and then you might say, PS, see that you brush your teeth each night. And, and some people think chapter 13 is a kind of PS like that, a lot of little bits of practical advice that really have nothing to do with the letter. Don't you believe it? The figure 13 is not in the original. Again, these figures were put in by men. They're not part of God's word. And we would understand God's word better if they weren't there. I really do believe this. And we then see that chapter 13 isn't a PS, brush your teeth every night. It's fundamental to the whole thing. It's not a practical postscript. It's working out what God has work in, worked in. Work out your own salvation, for it is God who works in you. That's the balance of Scripture. And therefore, having discussed beliefs and got our faith centered on Christ, the writer of this letter says, now, work it out. And he's so practical. He says, work it out in the use of your home. Work it out in your marriage bed. Work it out with your bank account. And so many other things that he says here which are so utterly down to earth that I make no apology for being very earthy this morning. We've been heavenly. We've been looking to Jesus. We've been gazing at heavenly sanctuaries. We've been looking at angels. We've been seeing things that others can't see. We've seen him who is invisible. Now, earth, where it's all got to be worked out. Because frankly, if our religion doesn't work out on Monday, then it's no good on Sunday. If it doesn't work out in our house and in our marriage and in our finance, then it doesn't work out in church either. It's got to be a practical faith. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And that's a neat little cliche. It's not mine, but I think it sums up everything I want to say this morning. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So don't say Jesus is Lord until he's Lord of all. Now let's look at this chapter in a rather novel way, perhaps. I've said that it's working it out practically, and there are many exhortations here to us to do certain things in our, our daily life. But I'm going to make them negative instead of positive. I think they'll come alive a little more. They're all positive exhortations to do this or to do that. But if I make them negative and put it like this, in the negative form, there is a list of things in this chapter that will tell you when you are backsliding. There are 12 signs in this chapter of a person who is no longer looking to Jesus, who's lost hold of their anchor within the veil and is drifting towards the rocks. And there are 12 rocks described in this chapter on which their life could founder. 
And any one of these 12 things could happen in any Christian's life as soon as we stop looking at Jesus, like Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee. When he looked at Jesus, he could walk on top of the sea. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, the sea got on top of him. And this is the profound thing of life, that as soon as we look at Jesus, we get on top of life, and nothing can get on top of us. But take your eyes off Jesus, and things get on top of us very quickly. And there are 12 things here that will get on top of us. And if I give you them in the negative form, then I think you'll understand. I'm only going to give you six this morning. That'll be enough to be going on with. And any one of these things could be a sign to you that you're drifting towards the rocks, that you've taken your eyes off Jesus. Number one, if you lose your love for your fellow Christians, you must have taken your eyes off Jesus. That's the first thing. For the first positive exhortation here is to keep on loving each other as brothers. Now that's something you can't do if you're not looking to Jesus. If you're not continuing in the faith, if you're not looking to him and trusting him to help, you will not be able to do this. Let's go back to the day you became a Christian. What happened when you became a Christian? You fell in love with Jesus, but one other thing happened as well which surprised you. You fell in love with his people. You felt that you belonged to them, you, want, you had affection for them, you wanted to be with them. To fall in love with Christ is to fall in love with his people, just as to hate Christ is to hate his people. The two are so bound together, you can't love the Lord without loving his people. You're a liar if you say you love the Lord and you don't love your brother. You see, you can't love Christ without loving all those you see in Christ. And if you're looking to Christ, you'll see everybody in him, and you'll love what you see. And so in our early days as a Christian, we fell in love with every Christian. Whatever age, whatever temperament, we just belonged. But if we take our eyes off Jesus, that doesn't last. And the tragedy is that you then revert to the most that human love can do, and that is to love those you like. Now, when you joined God's family, you didn't choose your brothers and sisters, and they're a funny lot. A dear lady in our previous church, after every church meeting, she would say, Good night, Pastor. And then she would shake her head with a rueful smile. And in sheer love, she would say, You know, Pastor, the Lord has a funny family, hasn't he? <laughs> and I had to agree after some church meetings. And maybe people thought that about me too. And therefore, if you're not looking to Jesus, you stop loving all your fellow Christians and you only love those you like. And it's not long before that develops into cliques and groups and snobbery and all kinds of things that can get right inside a church. And so the very first sign that you're slipping from Christ and that your faith is slipping and that you're not looking to him is that you can no longer love all your fellow Christians. And you begin to be put off some. You haven't the capacity because at a human level you can only like certain people. And nobody can go beyond that. And so at the human level, you choose your set and you stay within the set. And in a large church, you can do that even more than in a small church if you're not careful. Because you can just stay with your own group. And I want you to ask yourself, are you always talking to the same people after the service? Some of you do, I've noticed. And some of you mix with anybody. Ask yourself this question. Am I loving every fellow Christian? Am I going on loving them as brothers? After all, we're going to live together in heaven. We belong to each other as a family. And the kind of love that we're to have for each other is neither heterosexual nor homosexual. It is to be brotherly love, for which the Greeks had a particular word, Philadelphia. You know, when they founded that city in the States called Philadelphia, they hoped it was going to be a city of brotherly love. My, that's a city you don't walk the streets at night now. Philadelphia. There is no city on earth that can be called Philadelphia, but there's a new city, New Jerusalem, coming that could be called Philadelphia, where everybody will live as brothers in love, and we have the privilege, as long as we're looking to Christ, of anticipating that and enjoying it here and being brothers now. Do you see what happens? If you look towards Christ, you're looking towards the face of every other person who's looking towards Christ. But as soon as you take your eyes off Christ, you cannot see some of his people. Just work that out. Think it through. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
for all round Christ looking at him, you looking at Christ can see everybody who's looking at him too. But turn away from Christ and there are going to be some in the circle you will not see as brothers. Now that's the first sign of backsliding. And if you are finding that once you could get on with Christians better than you can get on with them now, ask yourself, when did I take my eyes off Jesus? It's the first sign. Now the second sign that is mentioned here is that you will begin to limit your hospitality if you take your eyes off Jesus. What you do with your house, your home, is a direct reflection of your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you doing with your home? Now once again, it doesn't say that you will cease hospitality if you take your eyes off Jesus, but what you will do is this, you will limit your hospitality to a known circle of people you already relate to. You will not entertain strangers to any great degree. For if you're looking at Christ, you find that you've got a love for the stranger and you want him within your gates. And so your home becomes a place where if anybody lived with you, they'd constantly meet new people. Not the old round, the same set. Jesus gave us a solemn warning, don't invite to your homes people who will just feel under obligation to invite you back so that it becomes a kind of mutual meal club. Don't do that. You invite those to your home who won't invite you back and who can't invite you back. But stretch out your hospitality. Don't just limit it to your set. Welcome the stranger. After all, Jesus said, I was a stranger and you took me in. And so a sign of backsliding is that our homes begin to be limited to a particular set of people. And no longer are they open to strangers people passing through, but to those who will invite us back, to those who belong to our group. Now the great privilege of entertaining strangers is mentioned here. It is a privilege. You never quite know what blessing will come into your home if you open it to a stranger. You just never know. Some of you have told me again and again what a privilege it has been to invite a total stranger who's attended the service here and you've invited them, come back home for lunch and you've told me afterwards, you know, I had no idea what a blessing it would be to us. I had no idea what they would bring into our home. Of course you hadn't because you hadn't had them before. And you could even, says the scripture, have a supernatural visitor from heaven because an angel can appear on earth exactly as a human being appears. And you could have had, some of you could have had in your home an angel from heaven. And when you get to heaven, you'd see them again. You'd recognize them and say, why, you came to our house to lunch. That happened to Abraham. It happened to Gideon. It happened to Manoah. And it's quite clear that it's anticipated that it will happen in the New Testament days as well. So entertain strangers, for some have had angels in their home. And you can't have an angel in your house without receiving a blessing. So that's the second sign of backsliding, of taking your eyes off Jesus. First sign that you no longer love all your fellow Christians, just the ones you like. Second sign, you limit your hospitality. Your house is no longer open to strangers. It's just open to your friends. What's the third the third sign of backsliding is that you forget Christians who suffer for their faith. And this is a group that we need to remember constantly. But if you take your eyes off Jesus, you'll take your eyes off those who suffer in his name. And they need prayer, and they need support, and they need concern. In fact, the letter to the Hebrews says, remember those in prison as if you were in prison. And remember those who are ill-treated as if you were being ill-treated. Do you know the meaning of the word sympathy? It's made up of, of two Greek words, sympathy. It's made up of the word sun, which means with, and pathine, which means to suffer. And sun pathine, or sympathy, or sympathy as it's become an English pronunciation, means to suffer with. Sympathy is to suffer with someone, as if you were in their shoes. Now people in prison will be forgotten unless Christians remember them. And there are hundreds of people this very day who are incarcerated in prisons and labor camps because of Christ. 
And if I take my eyes off Jesus, I'll take my eyes off them because when I look to Jesus, I find he's not so much looking at me, he's looking at them. He has a special concern for those who suffer in his name. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul could have said, well, I'm not persecuting you, Lord. I'm just after these Christians. But inasmuch as you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to me. Do you know that the Christian care of those in prison in the early days of the Christian church was so deep that the emperor finally passed a law that anybody visiting someone in prison would be put into prison themselves for the same sentence as the person they visited. Because in fact when the Christians were thrown into jail other Christians brought them food and in jails in those days they weren't fed. And in spite of that the Christians went on visiting more and more got thrown into jail. Are you thinking of Georgi Vins this morning? You're thinking of the many in China? You're thinking of what the Christians in South Vietnam are going to face over the next few months as they come under an atheistic regime that is anti-Christian? If you take your eyes off Christ, you'll forget these people. In fact, you'll become so bound up with your own problems, your own suffering, you'll just forget others. But the way to cure your own troubles is to think of those with much bigger ones and to remember those in prison and those ill-treated. When did you last pray for Christians in prison? Is that a sign that you're looking to Jesus? Now the fourth sign that a person has taken their eyes off Christ, they will have a lower view of marriage and things are likely to go wrong in the marriage. You see, the simple fact is that God's standards in relationship to marriage and divorce are the strictest there have ever been. Our Lord had the very highest standards in relation to these things, and one can state the biblical standards in relationship with sex very clearly. There are just two principles and everything flows from them. Absolute chastity outside marriage and absolute fidelity inside marriage. That's God's will and pattern. And I tell you, there isn't a man or woman in this congregation can live up to those standards by human nature alone. Not one. And therefore, you'll only keep them if you look to Jesus. And therefore, if you take your eyes off Jesus, these will slip. They're bound to. And the world says these standards are too high. We must lower the standards to meet the people. But Jesus said, no, we must lift the people to meet the standards. That's his way. It's the way of grace, not the way of ingratiation. And so he has these high standards. And the letter to the Hebrews says, let marriage be honored by all. Now, that could mean one of three things. And you can take your pick. I'm not sure which it means. Take your pick. It could mean that as over against the view that celibacy is a higher way, a more honorable way, that we should remember that marriage is honorable, that it's a valid relationship in God's sight and that Jesus himself honored it. Though he was never married, the first miracle was turning water into wine at a re wedding reception. And in this way, he honored the relationship. And therefore, we should never denigrate marriage. One of Paul's remarks, taken right out of context, that it's better to marry than to burn, taken out of context, can be made to look as if Paul was saying marriage is the sort of second best if you can't avoid it. That is a libel on Paul. If you read it in context, he said nothing of the kind. But there is the view that somehow marriage is a little lower than celibacy. It applies very much within Roman Catholic circles, but not there alone. If anything, today in our society, we've gone the other way and reg we regard being single as second best. It's not. It is also a calling. And in the Bible, being single is a gift of the Spirit and being married is a gift of the Spirit. And you need both gifts if you're to cope with both states. Now that's one possible meaning, let marriage be honored by all, meaning let them regard it as a, a proper and a right thing. A second meaning could be let it be honored by loyalty, by loyalty. There was a time when you could assume that divorce did not take place in Christian circles and remarriage. That picture is changing alarmingly rapidly. 
And we must face this very honestly and fairly. And we must go back to our Lord's crystal clear statement, remarriage is adultery. And however unpopular that may seem and however out of step with our contemporary society, we are looking to Jesus. And therefore marriage is to be honored. But there's a third possible meaning to this phrase and it certainly comes in the next phrase in the letter if it's not in this one. And that is that marriage is not to be regarded as legalized lust. And that marriage is not permission to include every unnatural vice within the marriage bed. It is still holy matrimony. And it isn't saying as long as you do anything with your married partner it's okay. It's saying let marriage still be an honorable thing within the marriage bed. In other words, any of these three things can happen when you take your eyes off Jesus. And all of them mean a lower view of marriage, a lighter view of the vows and loyalty involved in a Christian marriage. And it's a sign of taking your eyes off Christ that these things go wrong. Now the next thing, the fourth of the six things I want to mention this morning. The fourth thing that can go wrong, when you take your eyes off Christ, then things go wrong between you and your bank balance, between you and your money. And somehow the attitude changes from contentment to covetousness. Because by nature we are not content with what we have. By grace we can be. Do you know the greatest profit you could make on a business deal? I'll tell you, godliness with contentment is great gain. Or in simple English, that's the biggest profit you can make on any deal, to be content with what you have. Because this world is full of people who are not content with what they have. And the funny thing is that once you turn away from Christ and you get bitten by this bug which is there, Paul, the great apostle Paul said that he kept all the commandments except one and the one he couldn't keep was thou shalt not covet. That's an intriguing admission. The Pharisees were said to be lovers of money. Money isn't a bad thing. Money is a good thing. It's a very convenient thing. It helps me to get on a bus without carrying a sack of potatoes to pay the conductor. It's much more convenient than barter. It's a very handy thing is money. It means I can send help very quickly to Bangladesh. It can do so much good. Money is not the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And as soon as you get... As soon as instead of I have possessions, as soon as you have to say the possessions have me, then things have gone wrong. To be possessed by your possessions is a very sad form of slavery. And John D. Rockefeller once said, the poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. What a difference. Now, godliness with contentment. Do you think it's easier to be content with a little or content with a lot? I think it's harder to be content with a lot. Because money has this effect that the more you have, the more you want. It's like a drug. And businessmen I've met who've made enough to last them a lifetime and see them right through retirement and make every provision for their children cannot stop making money. It's bitten them and it becomes a consuming idol. They've just got to go on making money, though they've got ample. It's a disease. And I know it can be rationalized. If a business isn't going forward, it's going backward and all the rest. But deep down, one has got to be very sure that it's not the love of money behind it. The feeling of power at having made a big deal. And so contentment. That doesn't mean poverty. The Lord doesn't say you've got to be poor to be content. But the Bible does say that if you're rich, it'll be harder. Sometimes as hard as for a camel to get through the eye of a needle harder the more you have to be content but listen to the apostle paul again philippians 4 i have learned in whatever state i am therein to be content i've learned to be content with all things and with nothing i've learned to abound and to be abased i've learned to have everything and to have nothing and to be content if if the lord showers me with wealth i'm content if he takes it all away again i'm content oh what an achievement that is to be content and i'll tell you how you get it by looking to the lord and by saying, they may take everything else away from me, but the one thing they cannot take is the presence of my Lord. And the Lord is my helper, and I shall not be afraid what man can do to me, because he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. 
and he's promised to care for me and he's promised to provide everything I need. All these things will be added to me if I seek first his kingdom. And therefore, if I'm looking to him, I need not fear what man can do to my bank balance. I'm safe. Which would you rather have, the security of a very large sum of money but to be without the Lord or to have him and nothing? Who's more secure? And so therefore a fourth sign of our backsliding is that we develop a wrong attitude to money. A fifth sign of our backsliding. Just wondering if I've missed one out. Let me see. No, I think... Sixth, is it? I've given you five. Sixth. Right, well, let's take number six. Number six. If you take your eyes off Christ, you will tend to forget the saints who influenced you in your early Christian life. And how you need to remember them. Memory is a great gift of God. Thank God for it as long as you have it. It will begin to fail. But one of the delightful compensations that God has given us when we get old and our memory begins to fail, I'm already forgetting half your names. It's, it's really a nightmare to try and remember them all. What I'll be like in another 30 years, I dread to think. But when your memory fails in later years, one of the compensations is that you can remember earlier things far better than later things. You can go back, I know. <laughs> you can go right back to those early years and you can remember those great saints who spoke the word of God to you. That's a compensation for losing your memory later. It's important that you remember because their lives will be an example and an inspiration to you as well as their lips. Their lips told you the word of God. That's why they were a good influence on your character. They didn't give you their opinions. They didn't tell you what they thought. They gave you the word of God. Now you remember at this moment somebody who did that for you. Was it your mother who first taught you to pray and told you about Jesus? Was it a grandparent? Was it a Sunday school teacher? Was it a preacher, a pastor, Christian friend? Each of you think of someone. Now look, I'll tell you this. When you take your eyes off Christ, you'll forget that person. You'll forget them. But look to Christ and you'll remember those who pointed you to him. And there's a very unusual thing. It didn't come out in the translation I read. It says, consider the end of their faith. Now it's translated here, consider the outcome of their faith. That's one possible meaning of the word end. But the other possible meaning, which I think is the right one, is this. Consider the end of their lives of faith. Consider how they died. Consider how they died. Because Christianity is not only a way of life, it's a way of death. It's, it's not only to teach us how to live, it's to teach us how to die. And Christians die in a different way to others. And that is why a man in Beaconsfield, when he was nearing the end of the road, called for all his relatives to come and stay with him and said, come and see how a Christian dies. That's why my father, who, whom I rang last night, who is very seriously ill, but he was very confused and rambling a bit and saying all kinds of things. But one thing he said that was sensible was this. He said, David, please pray that I may die in a Christian way. Consider the end of their faith. Consider how they go out. Not how they started, not how they come in, but consider how they went out. And some of us have great memories of the end of faith in those who taught us the word of God. And what an example and what an inspiration. When people die looking forward, calm, peaceful, looking forward to being with Jesus, it's so different, as different as a Christian funeral is from other funerals. Consider the end of their faith. Of course, they come and go, they come onto the stage of life and they have their exits and any actor will tell you the exit is as important as the entrance. They have their exits and they cease to be an influence. They can go on speaking to us even though they are dead. They can yet speak because their example is still remembered by us. But we are to remember them in order to imitate them. 
Now, there's nothing worse than imitation, is there? It's terrible. It's artificial, isn't it? Depends on what you imitate. We are not to imitate the way they walk. We're not to imitate the way they dress. That would be ridiculous. Fashions move on. We're not to imitate a whole lot of things. There is only one thing we are to imitate. Remember them and imitate their faith. Because their faith is the same faith that you need. And when you imitate their faith, what will happen? It will put you in touch with the leader of your leaders. And he is the same yesterday, today and forever. They have changed. They've come and they've gone. We can remember them and it's an inspiration to us to do so. But he doesn't change and we can look to him and he's the same. And so we can imitate their faith. They look to him. We can look to him. And when you read some of the life stories of these saints who lived years and years ago, how much you can learn from them because their faith was the same in the same Lord. They went through the same spiritual problems that we went through. And so Jesus Christ is the same. Take your eyes off him, you'll forget about them too, but imitate their faith and you'll get your eyes back on him. Because they were men and women who lived and who died with their gaze fixed on Jesus. They ran their race, they completed the course, they won their crown. I wish I had the Methodist hymn book to use here regularly because I can always find a hymn in the Methodist hymn book to fit any theme I preach on. Because I can always find a Charles Wesley hymn that's drenched in scripture and just right on target. Surely the greatest hymn writer there's ever been. And one of my favorite hymns that he wrote is this. Author of faith, eternal word, whose spirit breathes the active flame. Faith, like its finisher and Lord, today as yesterday, the same. So we're to look to Jesus. If we don't, we will stop loving our fellow Christians. If we don't, our hospitality will be restricted to those we know. If we don't look to Jesus, we will have a lower view of marriage and we will not be so loyal. If we don't look to Jesus, we will begin to become covetous towards money and possessions. We'll cease to be content. If we don't look to Jesus, we'll forget the leaders who spoke to us the word of God and whose lives and deaths showed what can happen to someone who goes on looking. And so we come to Jesus, who's the same. Of no other human being can this be said. They are the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is sometimes said as a compliment of a friend. What I like about them is that they're always the same. Have you heard that said about a good friend. You know, you never catch them out. They're always as led to see and to help you. They're always ready to listen and so on. And, and so you hear, what I like about them, they're always the same. But they're not. I know they may not change as much as others do, but they change and they grow older and life's experiences change their character. And above all, they change in this way that they change location and there will be a time when you can no longer go to them for help and understanding and they will be out of your life there's only one human being that you can say he is always the same. Look to him, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do confess to you that we do take our eyes off you. There are so many other things to look at, so many distractions. And when we do, we sink and the waves and sea billows roll and we cry, save me. Lord, it would have been better if we just kept our eyes fixed on you and kept on top of these things. But we thank you for your patience and grace with us seizing us by the hand and lifting us up again into the boat. And so we praise you this morning that you will never, never change. Ministers come and go. Sunday school teachers come and go. Parents come and go. Saints who've helped us come and go. We remember them with gratitude. But Lord, we thank you that you are still with us and that you always will be. Amen.
Let's sing yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever. 